If the staff of a haunted hotel was bent on stealing your immortal soul, what would you do? Our protagonist never saw this one coming, although they probably should have realized something was wrong given the insane amount of red flags piling up all around them. Oh well, they're here now, and that's all that matters. Let's just hope they find a way to GTFO before things get even worse. Eh, who am I kidding? These people are screwed. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the evil goo in The Overnight. Jessie is an Instagram model, which means means she's legally obligated to drag her boyfriend slash phone holder into every antique store they run across during their cross-country road trip. Sorry guy, it's the law. Of course, as David's quick to remind her, seeking attention for a living is bound to have its drawbacks. Namely, the parasocial relationships she's unwittingly built with legions of unwashed superfans. And wouldn't you know it, here comes one now. Oh God! Hey, hey Jesse. Your skin is so beautiful. Nothing to read into there. Yup, that's totally something normal people say, right before they clunk you over the head and drop you down into a pit in their basement. Lucky for Jesse, she doesn't appear to be this guy's size, so he's willing to settle for a selfie instead, at least for now. That said, I'm not sure I'd give him one. I mean, for all we know, he's gonna stick us with an air tag, and at the very least, it'll probably make him even more obsessive. But regardless of whether we do or don't, we should still try to snap a discreet photo of him in case he starts becoming a problem later on. From there, we'll want to grab David and quietly inform him there's an escaped mental patient skulking around the back room before leaving the store immediately. After all, there's no telling whether he might be armed, although by the looks of it, he could probably still peel David like a tangerine either way, so running away is gonna be our best move. But of course, we couldn't possibly expect these two lovebirds to think logically with all this old garbage lying around, which is why instead of accepting the world is a dangerous place full of dangerous people, they let the normalcy bias take over and become hyper fixated on some hideous tchotchke. Eventually, the thrill of antiquing begins to wear off and the two return to their vehicle where Jessie finally relates the unnerving experience she had back in the store. Obviously, there's no law against being creepy, at least not yet. So it's not like we should go to the cops, but I'd at least want to make sure no one was tailing us before we got on our way. To do that, we'll want to stick to surface streets for a bit and wait to see if someone keeps popping up behind us. If so, we'll want to make four consecutive turns in the same direction. At that point, anyone that follows is probably doing so on purpose, in which case we'll want to call the cops and head straight to the nearest station. We can also do this on the highway by taking an exit and then immediately re-entering. Although, we want to be careful, as a red light at the end of the exit ramp could give them an opportunity to attack. Ultimately, Jesse and David decide the encounter was no big deal and get back on the road. However, just when it seems like all the weirdness is behind them, a familiar face from back at the antique shop drops in out of nowhere to ruin their day. Oh. My phone! Forgot about your phone. Look what happened to your tire. More importantly, look at what's sticking out of it. You were just holding that ugly piece of crap in your hands not 30 minutes ago, and somehow, it winds up in the middle of a random stretch of deserted highway with a nail sticking out of it. No f way this is a coincidence. Obviously, someone put it here. Someone who saw us holding it and knew we'd be coming this way. And that means whoever did this not only knows where we're going, they also want us to know that they know what our travel plans are. Furthermore, because we pretty much came straight here from the antique shop, this thing couldn't have been sitting here for very long. Meaning, whoever set it up is probably close by and possibly even watching us right now. In that case, the only thing we should be thinking about right now is getting back in the car, turning around, and limping back towards the last town while searching for a cell signal. Once we have one, we need to call 911 using David's non-destroyed phone and tell them someone laid a deliberate spike trap in the road, albeit one with a very low probability of success. From there, we'll give them a description of our vehicle along with our direction of travel and just keep poking along until they find us. Is this going to destroy the tire? Absolutely. And probably the rim too, but there's no way I'd risk setting myself up like a sitting duck to change the tire even if Jesse had one, which she does not. Yeah, I'm guessing this heap 
probably hasn't seen an oil change in the last 50,000 miles either. Whatever the case, our road trip has come to an end. At no point back in the antique shop did we mention where we were headed, meaning whoever's behind this probably knew our destination from the very beginning. No doubt as a result of Jesse's constant oversharing online. Sucks to say, but psycho stalkers on the internet are a reality, and no amount of angry TikToks is going to change that. So, until we find a way to effectively purge all of the worst aspects of human behavior, the only way to stay safe as a public figure is by practicing good OPSEC. You know, maybe don't tell the whole world exactly where you're going, when you're going, and how you're going to get there. I don't know. For now, all we can do is return home and arm ourselves to the teeth in case the weirdos come back with us. As a matter of fact, had Jesse and David thought to do that beforehand, the rest of this nightmare would never even make the news. It's a tale as old as time. At any rate, despite the fact that they're clearly being targeted by someone with ill intentions, it seems the pair simply can't bear the thought of blowing off whatever manner of brain damage convention they must be heading to. So they decide to press onward in hopes they'll find a repair shop in the next town over. Not sure why they wouldn't just Google one when they get service, but I guess these people are both terminally online and tech illiterate. The perfect storm. Speaking of storms, one seems to be rolling in, which combined with the car's rapidly worsening condition, prompts the young couple to pull over and find a place to stay for the night. Also, they call this place a ghost town, but if you ask me, it looks like a fairly modern and well-maintained community, so realistically, they should have at least a couple of options in terms of lodging. But being spoiled urbanites, they automatically assume any place without at least two major international airports must be like Megaton, leading them to stop at the first place they see, even though they both find it creepy as as for the car, repairs will have to wait. According to the hotel clerk, Salim, the entire town is shutting down early tonight because of the storm, which is totally a thing people do in the 21st century, and not just a ploy to bring in business. Whatever the case, Salim assures them it'll be fine, as the small number of guests they have tonight means he'll be available to cater to their every whim. And I say we take him up on that immediately by asking to use the desk phone. Given everything we went through with the antique store creep who, by the way, is almost certainly the same person that spiked our tire earlier, we should probably let someone know where we are and how long we intend to stay, just in case things go horribly wrong. And without any cell service in this area, landlines are our only option. But once again, Jesse and David aren't worried about that. Instead of doing literally anything to hedge their bets against possible negative outcomes, they get themselves cleaned up and head down to the dining room for some of that delicious prime rib. No, I'm a vegetarian. She just ignored me. Better hope that's all she does. Still, aside from their handling of Jesse's absurd dietary requirements, the hotel staff's been extremely attentive, maybe even a little too much so. And yet, despite there being pretty much no one else staying at the hotel, both Salim and the hotel's owner, Mr. Monroe, appear to be constantly in some kind of rush, further evidenced by the fact that they're constantly looking down at their matching wristwatches. It's not enough to conclude there's some kind of evil afoot, but at the same time, I see no harm in simply asking them about it in case it might affect our decision to stay. For example, they might tell us that the backup generator keeping the lights on right now could crap out at any second and potentially leave us stranded inside the elevator. That wouldn't be good. And sure enough, Salim comes out of nowhere to tell them exactly that, which for some reason means they have to return to their room right now. Or maybe it has something to do with the gruesome a murder scene that Jesse swears she saw while walking back through the hallway. Who knows? What matters is that this place really sucks. The doors stick, the owner's a creep, there's ghost kids bleeding all over the carpets, and don't even get me started on the showers. Oh, what the no! mm, starting to see why nobody stays here. Evidently, David is too. And that complimentary mud bath was the final straw. As for Jesse, she's gone from seeing dead people to completely out cold in a matter of minutes, which would honestly make me wonder if they didn't slip something in all that free booze they were dishing out. For real though, David's an absolute failure of a boyfriend, the way he brushed off her vivid hallucinations as her just being tired. I mean, unless that's normal for her to flip the 
out like that for no reason. You'd think someone about to pop the question would find that kind of outburst concerning. And of course, David doubles down on his negligence by leaving Jesse alone in an unknown state to go about the plumbing, during which time he managed to lock himself out of the room without any shoes on. Awesome. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no amount of comp amenities that would make me want to stay the night in this dump after getting slimed like that. And with the phone lines to the lobby down, I see no reason to go down there and tell Salim we're leaving, just to then go back upstairs, pack our crap, and leave. In that case, I think the best course of action here would be to start getting our stuff together now, so we could just drop our keys off at the desk and limp Jesse's ruby red box over to the next available hotel. Obviously, that starts with waking her up to make sure she's okay. This can be accomplished through a variety of means, but for the purpose of this video, we'll assume that David still wants to marry her when this is all over. The first thing I would try is repeatedly calling her name at a progressively louder volume while gently shaking her by the shoulder. Your sense of hearing works just as well when you're sleeping as when you're awake. So as long as she has functioning ears, talking to her alone should do the trick. However, if that doesn't work, we'll want to add light to the equation by shining our phone light directly into her face. Finally, if all else fails, we should try picking her up and dropping her back onto the bed from a few inches up. After all, it worked in Inception. Keep in mind that Jesse didn't drink all that much with dinner, and even if she did have one too many glasses of wine, the aforementioned tactics should still be more than enough to wake her up. If not, we should start to seriously consider the possibility that something's gone horribly wrong. Based on my viewership analytics, I'd imagine a good number of you have seen someone passed out after a night of heavy drinking, but even if someone's extremely intoxicated, you should still be able to wake them up without too much effort. Granted, they probably won't be very coherent, but they'll at least be somewhat responsive to external stimuli. On the other hand, if you've reached the point of pouring water on someone's face and they still won't budge, call an ambulance. Yeah, yeah, jokes about American healthcare costs, go right ahead, but just remember, Funerals aren't all that cheap either. Getting back to Jesse, if we can't wake her up, I'd say that definitely lends credence to my suggestion she might have been poisoned. In which case, not only do we need to get her medical attention, we also need to avoid the person who did this to her. First things first, we should use David's phone to text our situation to 911. There's a large and ever-expanding number of jurisdictions across the United States that can accept emergency service requests via text. And in cases like this one, where cell phone reception's too poor to make a call, it might still be possible to send out an SMS. What we do next depends on Jessie's condition. If she seems to be breathing okay, we might be able to barricade ourselves inside the hotel room and wait for a response to her SOS message. Otherwise, if her breathing seems labored or her lips are turning blue, we'll need to get help Help right away. At that point, I'd try smashing out the window and calling out to anyone at ground level to go for help. Beyond that, we'll have to carry her down to the car and go searching for a hospital, all the while keeping a lookout for Salim, or pretty much anyone, since there's no telling who else might be involved. Probably be a good idea to fashion some kind of weapon too, just in case. Even breaking off one of those vintage table legs would be better than nothing, especially since it turns out someone in this place is a murderer. Oh. God. I guess that explains the weight. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say this is why Salim was so concerned about showing us back to our room all of a sudden. And the fact that law enforcement hasn't shown up to deal with the body suggests he's either the one responsible or he's looking to cover for the person that is. Whatever the case, this pretty much confirms our worst fears about this place. So we should probably take this opportunity to go grab Jesse and GTFO, right? Well, according to David, the correct thing to do right now is sit down at the bar next to some random cowboy and slug back a few shots of Evan Williams. Cause you know that always helps in situations like these. Never mind the fact that for all we know, this weirdo's the one who did the chef in. And now to commemorate the moment, he's decided to share his bottle of strychnine infused bourbon with us. What a pal. Meanwhile, back upstairs, Jesse's decided to stop being unconscious just in time to realize things are not okay. Between David's absence and that mess he left behind in the shower, she knows she needs to go find him. But upon getting dressed and attempting to leave the room, it seems she's been locked inside. 
Yeah, this is definitely not normal hotel procedure under any circumstances. Not only is this a massive fire hazard, it would absolutely constitute wrongful imprisonment. That said, there are a few reasons these scumbags would do something like this, and they're all really bad ones. Meaning, we definitely don't want to be here when they eventually come back. At the very least, we should lock the security bolt and pile up all the furniture in front of the door to make re-entry about as difficult for them as we possibly can. Once that's out of the way, you know what time it is. That's right, we're making a bed sheet rope. The hotel only appears to be a few stories tall, so between what's already on the bed and any extras they might have supplied us with, we should have more than enough to make it to the ground level. But we can tie in curtains or even bath towels if we start to run out. In case you haven't seen my video on Evil Dead Rise, one king-sized sheet should make roughly 12 feet of rope. Attach each sheet together using square knots, and then fasten it to something sturdy and heavy, like that solid wood bed frame. Once we go over this side, we'll want to loop the rope around our foot using the S-wrap technique to control our descent. And from there, it's a simple matter of slowly sliding down the rope until we reach ground level. Sounds easy, right? Yeah, I didn't think so. But what exactly is the alternative? Even if David comes back, he probably won't be able to get back inside. And if Salim or Mr. Monroe comes to get us. Well, here's hoping Jessie's got the wherewithal to see the situation for what it is and not immediately turn her back on them. Wait, did you hear that? That's David. Come on, we have. God damn it. I mean, just think for a second. You're locked inside your room against your will. Then someone shows up and the door suddenly unlocked. Yeah, you think they might have had something to do with it? Well, whatever. Let's check in on David. Since we last saw him, things have gotten significantly spookier around the hotel. First, he runs into a severely jaundiced woman who really wants to play with him. And then a couple blood-soaked bedwetters come out of nowhere talking about being dead. It's pretty much all the worst parts of The Shining. Only instead of having psychic powers, David's just an idiot. Eventually, he winds up following an extremely aloof writer back to the man's room, where he finally gains access to a working telephone. And you'll never guess what he does with it. That's right, he uses it to call Selim and no one else. Dude walked in on a crime scene 15 minutes ago, and now he's calling in room service? Unbelievable! Fortunately, before David can make everything worse by giving a potential murderer his current location, all that writer's block finally sends Hemingway to the end of his rope. Literally. Don't worry though, turns out he does this all the time. It's not that he's bad at it or anything. On the contrary, he got it done the first time. The man's a ghost is what I'm trying to say here. And the realization of this coupled with what David saw a few minutes ago helps him reach the conclusion that he really needs to get the out of there. Before he can do that, however, David runs into Salim over by the elevator and decides now is an appropriate time to tell him about that one-star Yelp review he's gonna write when this is over. Naturally, Salim responds in kind by holding him at gunpoint and explaining that David did, in fact, sign the guest book, thereby agreeing to an unknowable set of conditions established by the hotel, because that is how he thinks contracts work. You're crazy. Aren't we all a little insane? No, that's just something the crazy ones tell you, so you put up with their bullshit. That being said, David's definitely got something wrong with him, as not only does he neglect to pick up the firearm after performing an effective disarm, he pretty much forgets about this entire encounter two minutes later after running into Monroe. For real though, one of the dude's employees literally just threatened to kill him, and David thinks the guy's gonna start answering questions. Best case scenario, everyone here is a ghost, and nothing he says matters. Worst case scenario, only half the people here are ghosts, and Monroe brained the lunch lady with a meat cleaver. Either way, we shouldn't waste our breath with this guy, especially when there's still at least one more of them screwing around here somewhere. Bring him to the lobby, please. At least he said please. Of course, Monroe probably should have also told Salim to tie him up, because there's absolutely no telling when David might wake up and knock his dumb ass out again. You know, like when Salim foolishly turns his back to go check on literally nothing. And sure enough, David comes out of his coma at just the right time to stage an effective counter ambush. Or at least it would have been effective had David remembered the five Ds. Plus one, distance, deflect, dominate, distract, disarm, disable. 
He covered the distance all right by closing the gap to the point he could deflect the barrel of Salim's revolver. But things ultimately fell apart during the domination stage because that's where he decided to stop. And you know what that means. You shot me! And you know why? It's because you can't just grab onto the bad guy's wrist and wait for a miracle to happen. You've got to distract him. And what better way to go about that than by viciously biting his face and neck? This ain't no fairy dust bull training we're talking about here. Real hand-to-hand -hand combat should be hideous and off-putting. Only then will you have a chance at performing a successful disarm and then subsequently disabling the attacker by savagely beating him to a quivering pulp with his own gun. The only silver lining to David's ineptitude is that he's finally reunited with Jesse, although definitely not in the way that he probably hoped. Now down in Monroe's weirdo edgelord bunker shrine, we finally learn the reason for all their strange behavior. It turns out that freakish yellow-eyed chick David saw earlier is Monroe's twin sister, who we come to find out was possessed by a demon back in the 80s, which is part of the reason she looks so terrible. And also, it made her brutally hack up their parents and stuff. Anyway, Monroe intends to free his sister from her possession by offering up Jesse's soul in exchange for hers. Yes, apparently at no point over the last 40 some odd years did any guest show up that would make a suitable sacrifice. Sacrifice. Who knows? Maybe the demon's really picky. Whatever the case, it seems Monroe didn't properly talk things through with his henchmen, as Salim was under the impression their sacrifice would be used to bring his sons back from the dead. This, of course, was all a lie to guarantee his loyalty, and Monroe pretty much tells him to cry about it, perhaps not realizing Salim's gun is in fact a gun. And as we all know, there's more than one way to purge a demon. Come play with us forever. Game over. It's just too bad Salim didn't think to follow that up by putting one in Monroe as well. After all, dude's kidnapping and murdering people to save this chick. Obviously, he's gonna slit your guy throat for shooting her in the head. Fortunately for our heroes, the preceding debacle bought Jesse just enough time to undo her restraints, which she almost immediately way by going for the ladder instead of grabbing whatever she could and taking the fight to Monroe. Dude's standing right next to it. You think he might try and stop you from escaping? Ultimately, however, it doesn't make much of a difference, as the big bad's still gonna run straight into her hastily improvised pipe spear like it was calling his name. Die! Oh. Oh. Whatever, dude. I guess all that's left to do now is go for help before David loses too much cherry aid. But first, we might want to move him a little farther away from that pool of nasty black goo leaking out of the demon chick's head hole. Something tells me it's not super great to let people with open gunshot wounds marinate in that sh Oh, well, it'll probably be fine. After all, Jesse just needs to flag down a passing motorist, and they're pretty much home free. And sure enough, she spots a taxi within like 30 seconds of walking out the door. Some ghost town, all right. The driver claims he doesn't have his phone, which is definitely a lie. But at least he's nice enough to take her to the police station. Question is, why wouldn't she ask for help carrying David out to the car so they can take him to the hospital? Unfortunately, it probably wouldn't make a difference, since all it takes is a brief look at the ugly doll on the man's dashboard to realize he's not here to help. Wanna take a selfie, Jesse? <gasps> See, I told you this guy was unhinged. Now, if only Jesse had thought to grab Salim's revolver before leaving the basement, then we could take the car and get rid of this freak show once and for all. Instead, her only option is to retreat back to the hotel where there hopefully aren't any more hostile staff members with demon-possessed siblings in need of a soul to steal. Still, it's not the worst place to lie low right now. As Jesse quickly realizes, we can use the tunnel system to give Superfan the slip. And there's more than a few weapons down here we can use to defend ourselves should he find us again. You know, like Monroe's dagger or those sharp pipes or the gun. But of course, Jessie's not interested in any of that. Right now, her only concern is what happened to her mortally wounded boyfriend. Although, judging by that black goopy handprint on the wall, I've got a feeling she's not going to like what she ultimately finds. Through the help of the disgruntled writer guy, Jessie navigates the tunnel system back to the hotel bar, where she finds David seemingly having made a full recovery. Right away, it's clear he's not quite himself. Then again, that's probably a good thing 
thing. As I sincerely doubt the man he was would have been able to wrench the stalker's head off with his bare hands. Of course, if David's capable of something like that, Jesse doesn't stand a chance. Worse yet, he's actually talking about moving into the hole. Just imagine what Jesse's legion of mindless followers will think when they find out she lives in a hotel. No, there's only one way out. <laughs> It had to be done. Also, I guess she took the revolver after all. So yeah, it's a good thing she did that. And with that, Jessie's finally free to resume her career as an influencer, but not before getting too close to that black goo billowing out of David's chest and to transforming herself into a demonic spawn bent on feeding off the attention of millions for years to come. So basically, nothing's changed. In the end, only Jessica made it out alive. And even then, that depends on your definition of the word alive. One thing's for sure, had they seen the stalker spike trap for what it was and responded accordingly, they never would have checked into the hotel to begin with, thereby preventing this entire mess from happening in the first place. Of course, once they were already inside, they had ample opportunity to realize Monroe and Salim were up to no good, and even more opportunities to escape capture via the strategies I proposed. For those reasons, I think the overnight was beaten. Moral of the story, never stop at antique shops.